were walking into that old brick school building and I was there to do a class observation because this special class for kids on the autism spectrum and with Fragile X were supposedly doing great in this new program. So I wanted to see for myself. So as I opened that big old wooden door to get into the school building, I walked up a couple steps and there, like right in front of me was a student with this kind of dingy white towel clothes pinned over his head. And he was sitting there in a chair facing the front door of that school. And I was just like flabbergasted, right? I mean, it's like, what? How can this be happening in a public school? And they're, you know, right in front. So when people come in the school, they see that. And then I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe they got some advice from an attorney that you want to be upfront with how you treat students in the program. I don't know. But it was pretty shocking and it was just like, this is my introduction to this wonderful class that you hear about. So I signed in, I walked into the classroom and there were, I don't know, probably only about eight study carols set up, you know, where students have a desk, a chair, you know, three-way wall so they can focus and concentrate and be in compliance. Um, but then along each of those study carols, and here comes my dog, along each of those study carols was the spray bottle. And so I asked, I asked one of the parents, you know, what are those spray bottles for? And she said, oh, we use that, you know, it's part of their behavior plan. And if they aren't following directions after so many times, then we just give them a small squirt in the face. And it was like, what? I mean, it's like, how can any of this be ethically, morally right? How can kids in public schools be treated like this? In the name of, oh, it's in their behavior plan, so it must be okay. So I don't know how much experience you've had if your own child or if your teacher and students have been on behavior plans. So let us know in the comments what your experience is with functional behavior assessments and behavior intervention plans. Hey, Karen, Karen's here from Colorado. And Karen says, these are the sort of things that scare me so badly. I know, and it's, um, I, you know, it's, it's nothing that I would ever endorse for any student. And it's those things that we need to make sure we know what is going on at our child's school and in the classroom. Um, and maybe we can talk about that in a little bit as far as observations and what if you get declined for making a school observation, all of that. But it is really important to know um, because all of this needs to be addressed. So today we're going to be looking at typical um, results that you might get from a functional behavior assessment that tells you the function of the behavior and why we might not want to use those traditional functional behavior assessments to help us support students at school. So we'll also be sharing what the federal law, IDEA, says about FBAs and BIPs, the Behavior Intervention Plan. And I think you might be surprised about what IDEA says about FBAs and BIPs, so in BIPs. Um, 
So stay tuned. Let us know what your experience is. Hey, Shannon. Shannon says, my son's school is just now developing a BIP. So I'm just here to learn. They have been conducting an FBA, and I believe that is giving them good data to start. Cool. And Sharon, um, or not Sharon, Shannon. <laughs> Shannon, um, also in our Trailblazers group, I'll kind of point you to some other things that you can look at. One for functional behavior assessment, you wanna make sure that they've done a parent interview. It's not like required, but it's best practice that they involve the parent in developing the report and the assessment. Um, the other tip I would have is for you to ask for a draft copy or whatever they have with the results of their functional behavior assessment before, excuse me, you go to the IEP meeting. So you have a chance to kind of digest that. And you can even um, ask questions about that in our trailblazer group. Okay. Um, because yeah, there's, there's a lot to learn about all of these behavior kinds of things, right? Um, so yes, we'll be talking about some alternatives to traditional functional behavior assessments. I'll be giving you some resources. And actually, if you are on my email list on Tuesday mornings, I send out an email um, and I can give you some more um, resources. This is one of Dr. Ross Green's book, Lost at School. Um, and we're gonna be talking about Ross Green's um, program and I don't know, framework for how to help support kids. This one is really good. This is Heather Forbes. She just had a big national conference in Denver um, with other speakers, Ross Green was there. And um, she is really well known for how to help schools be more trauma informed and make um, better choices than some of the traditional behavior plans we come up with. Um, so this is called Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control. Alfie Cohen is like a wonderful guru to go to. Um, he just has thought provoking articles, um, books. One of his books that I recommend is Punished by Rewards by Alfie Cohen. Another one of his books, I like this one, um, Beyond, uh, Beyond Discipline from Compliance to Community, Alfie Cohen. And like I said, if you're on my email list, I'll be sending a list of, um, you know, other resources for you to look at. And then this one is another one by Heather Forbes. She's in Boulder, Colorado, and this is called the Trauma Informed School, a step-by-step -step implementation guide for administrators and school personnel. Um, so the other thing that both um, Dr. Green and Heather Forbes have are online trainings that parents and educators can tap into. So those are going to be a couple of the, of the alternatives that we're going to be talking about today from your traditional FBA. So let's go over here and yeah, just keep your questions and comments coming. <laughs> um, so identifying the function of a behavior isn't enough. I have been to many an IEP meeting where they talk about the results of an FBA and they give, um, you know, you'll hear a lot like, oh, he's just seeking attention or he's trying to avoid his work or um, what else? Oh, they're, you know, escape, elopement, you know, so they come up with one of four or sometimes people have six different um, functions of a behavior. And that will be like their answer. It's like, aha, now we know that kid is seeking attention and he's trying to be the class clown all the time. And therefore we're gonna write this behavior plan. Um, 
But to me, that doesn't go deep enough. It's kind of the old tip of the iceberg. That function is up here at the tip of the iceberg and we want to go further down. So let's look at what we can do here. So one of the common functions that you'll hear from a person that comes from the real behaviorist background is the child is avoiding work. Well, if you come to that conclusion and if you say, aha, we figured out the reason, this child is trying to um, get out of doing his work. So we're going to write a behavior goal that he's going to complete his work within so many minutes, so many trials, or that he is going to stay on task for so many minutes. And we're going to make sure we work on, we don't want him to avoid his work. We want him to get his work done. But you know what? I ask, it's like, but why is he trying to avoid the work? So to me, avoid the work is the tip of the iceberg. See where I am. <laughs> if we um, look underneath what the underlying cause might be, it might be several things. And that's part of being the detective that you have to be. So we're not going to just stop at avoiding work. We're going to look underneath. <coughs> I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. So sometimes students avoid doing the work that they're asked to do because it's too easy. It's like, what? I think most of us always think, oh, kids don't want to do the work because it's too hard or they don't understand it. But actually, kids can not do their work, avoid doing that work you're asking them to do because they're tired of people asking them the same questions. What color is this? Tell me the name of the letter. You know, whatever the skills are, if it's too easy for your child, that might be why they're avoiding work. So if we say avoid work, our behavior goal is going to be you know, more time on task, more work completion, more compliance. When I give the direction, do this, he's going to do it. But if the reason he's avoiding the work is because it's too easy, does my behavior goal of let's see how many more minutes he can be on task and get this worksheet done, is that going to help anything? No. So if you know the underlying reason of avoiding work is because it's too easy, what could a teacher do, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, maybe we need to give him harder work. So that's why we always want to look at that underlying re um, reason. Hey, Heidi. Heidi is here from Utah. She says, I'm so excited about this topic. Thank you. And Heidi is another parent trailblazer along with Shannon. Um, Shannon said, I get this for my son. He says the work is too hard. So yeah, so then if he's avoiding the work because it's like too hard, then we have to figure out, so what is it? You know, is it because I'm giving him verbal directions and he's not understanding what I'm saying? And if I had an accommodation of, I'm going to pair a visual, you know, prompts with a verbal prompt, then do we see that he it's not too hard anymore and he understands what he's supposed to do? Is it too hard because there's some skills, you know, underneath that, that he needs to learn first before he can do what the work is up here? And we're going to be talking about that in a minute when we talk about Dr. Um, Ross Green and how he talks about kids lagging skills. So we have to figure out what that lagging skill is that makes that work too hard. Is the work that they're asking him to do at his desk, is it supposed to be at an independent level where he can pretty much do it like 90% of it? Or is the work that they're giving him more at his frustration level where he's not going to be successful? 
And if you're like me, <laughs> you know, when you have hard things to do, sometimes you take a break and you don't want to start doing them right away and you avoid them for maybe days, <laughs> right? So we've got to look at if it's too hard, what is making that too hard? Um, is it because the worksheet has like so many problems on it? It's hard for him to like focus. So they need to put less problems on a page and have more white space around it. That could be an accommodation. So you don't have to solve one. You don't have to solve all these behavior challenges with a behavior plan or a behavior goal. Sometimes they can be um, resolved with support from an accommodation. So let's go back here and look at some other examples that probably you have heard before. So as I said, with Dr. Ross, he talks about the importance of identifying lagging skills, why the child is having the difficulty, what skills the child needs in order to solve problems. So Shannon, if you can talk to the team, even before you have your meeting, you could talk informally with the teacher and say, have we really figured out the why the work is too hard for him? Um, or, you know, whatever the other, you know, complaints they have. <laughs> um, one category of lagging skills is under executive functioning. And this can happen, you know, with a variety of kids for, right, a variety of reasons. But here are just a few examples of what, um, Exact, you know, what might be the executive functioning skills that they're lagging, handling transitions, doing things in a logical order. And oops, <laughs> it's like my cursor is not letting me go where I want to go. Um, figuring out how long a task will take, reflecting on multiple thoughts, ideas. So if they have like too many things going on, too many directions at a time, that can be hard. They might have a hard time ignoring irrelevant noises, noises that don't bother us, but if they're hypersensitive and that's like a trigger, that can be something that we want to know and we want to address. Um, maybe it's just a child that um, needs more time to think, to process before responding. And we need to look at a variety of solutions that the child will buy into as we try to formulate a plan that, you know, will help support the child as they're learning these new types of executive functioning skills. So again, look at these, think about them, think about what might be accommodations that you could put in the IEP that um, would be helpful for your child. Now, another thing that you hear a lot is they'll do an FBA and they'll say, ah, the function of this child's behavior is they are just seeking attention all the time. Well, that's the tip of the iceberg. The underneath, the underlying cause of that function is something that we need to explore. But why are they seeking that attention? Um, again, without knowing that underlying cause, I think the goals, so many times the behavior goals that we write for kids are not going to be the ones that are really going to provide um, the support and help them learn the new skills that they need to learn. Um, so it's really, really imperative <laughs> to me that we always look underneath. Um, so Karen says, let me put my glasses on. When I picked little Mr. up from school yesterday, I was told it was a day full of no, stop and help, that he didn't want to do any of the things that day. He's definitely big on avoiding things. So working with him instead of against him is going to be so important to his participation. Yes, for sure, Karen. And you are—you have some great skills as far as 
um, identifying those things. So I think it would be great to have a conversation with the teacher um, because you know, and what you know kind of intuitively about your son is then something that you need to share with the staff so they don't spend a lot of time figuring out, ah, if we just did this, it would have worked so much better, right? Instead of fighting him about, no, it's time for, you know, whatever, um, to kind of go with the flow. And we all have days like that, right? I mean, I can be crabby. <laughs> And, you know, I have to check that when I'm talking with my husband and like he's done nothing wrong and I'm crabby about something else that has happened. And I just have one of those terrible, no good, very bad days. And that might be this. So the other thing to look at, Karen, of course, is to see, you know, how often things like this are happening. Um, but I think, you know, just asking for a short meeting with the teacher before after school and having a conversation about it would be really helpful. Um, so let's look at some other possible reasons why something might be happening at school, because that why is what we want to tap into. Now, another category of lagging skills is language processing. So we talked about kids that have lagging executive functioning skills, but some kids have language processing. Um, there's a, a lag with the skills there that they need to process language. So what are some examples of that? Things like they have difficulty expressing their concerns, needs, or thoughts. So that expressive language part. Um, they have a hard time understanding spoken directions. And maybe even when you only give them a couple directions, they're still unsure of, you know, what exactly you're asking them to do. Or if they're, you know, involved in the conversation with friends, maybe they, you notice that they have a hard time following along with a conversation. I mean, these are just a couple examples, right? But look at the language processing skills that your child might be lacking in. And that might be the reason um, that you see certain behaviors. And so, again, if you only stop at the function of the behavior, you never get to that underlying cause. Um, and that's what we want to make sure that everybody does. Um, again, it might go back to those executive functioning. They might have lagging skills in executive functioning and language processing. You just have to look. Um, and we'll talk about an assessment that Dr. Ross Green has that you can use in your school. So Shannon, that would be good for you um, to share and ask the staff to do that too. Um, Another function that you hear sometimes after a functional behavior assessment is done is that the child is trying to escape. Um, again, what's the reason? What's that underlying reason why they might be trying to escape? Well, a third category of lagging skills is emotion regulation. So let's look at some of those examples. Difficulty thinking rationally managing irritability in age-appropriate ways. <laughs> so that's me. I got to figure that out some nights. Um, managing disappointment in age-appropriate ways. And so also this, um, you know, this also could look at some sensory issues. And again, we don't want to make assumptions that um, if a child is trying to escape, it just means that, you know, they're running away and they're trying to get rid of people or whatever. Um, but we want to look at the underlying reason. Um, so let me know if you have other examples here that you want to share with us. Or if your child has behavior goals, what do those behavior goals look like? What has a functional behavior assessment for your child look like? So we can interact while we're here. 
So keep your comments and questions coming. Again, you know, we always want to look back at the other kinds of skills. You know, they might have some skills with language processing, with executive functioning. You know, all of these could be added or it could just be one area. Um, sometimes you'll hear after an FBA, the function is for the child to get something tangible, like a prize from the treasure chest or something to eat a snack or, you know, something that's, you know, like time on his iPad or whatever. But just knowing that they want to get something tangible doesn't help us. We need to dig deeper. We need to ask that why. Now, here's another category of lagging skills. It's called cognitive flexibility. And this is um, one of the skills that my son is lagging in. Uh, you know, that kind of black and white thinking, um, that hard time dealing with routine changes. I mean, if he really needs to know his, I mean, he's an adult and he, you know, lives in a house with a couple of roommates and such, but um, he still has a hard time being flexible with there's a change. Um, he wants to know when, you know, there's holidays, Monday holidays coming up because Monday's the day he goes to withdraw some cash from his bank. And if he goes to the ATM machine, he has to draw it out in different denominations. And so anyway, Flexible thinking can be one of those underlying causes. Kim, hey, Kim from Iowa, listening while driving. <laughs> but you be safe there. <laughs> um, and yes, and Kimberly also is one of our parent tra trailblazers. So if you want to know more about our trailblazer group, let me know. Um, because on our weekly shows here, we can kind of scratch the surface of things. But what I love about our membership group is we can really dive deeper into topics. I can pull out certain resources just meant for your situation. Um, so if you would like to be a parent uh, trailblazer with us, let me know in the comments and I can get back with you. So Shannon says... My son's special ed teacher emailed me today and said huh, he's in a constant battle with his energy levels and keeping the speed of his thinking in check. In check. This is an underlying cause of many behaviors. So, yeah. So, First, I would want her to give some examples because like what I think about when I hear constant battle with his energy levels and keeping the speed of his thinking in check. So what would help is to get some specific examples from the teacher, also his you know general ed teacher, and then for you to think of examples of how you see this at home too. And then you can you can try and look at all those different scenarios, you know, a couple, you know, by the special ed teacher, general ed teacher at school, your, you know, observations that you see um, at home and then see. So is this like sensory related? Um, is it that he's at a high energy level and that comes out in terms of like being impulsive or, what, but yeah, so what I like about when you find out the underlying cause is that that, you know, gives us a place where we can support the student instead of like punishing them or, you know, thinking this is, you know, some horrible thing that, you know, is going to um, affect him if he doesn't calm down, if he doesn't sit down if you know all of those kind of school behaviors um so instead how we can channel that energy how we can um you know look at other sensory areas and see if you know where he's sensory seeking where he's avoiding sensory stim you know stimulation um but yeah so that's good and i would just 
keep those conversations going, Shannon. And like I said, kind of track different examples that people have. And Karen says, my guy has lagging skills in all those categories so fast. So it's hard to know where to start sometimes. Yeah, and that's for sure. And Karen, I don't know if you're familiar with um, Lives in the Balance. I've got their website here. So this is from Ross Green. And he has like so many super articles, videos for teachers, for parents. And he does talk about how you can, you know, figure out which skill area you want to start working on first. So, um, and I keep, I always keep thinking Karen's a trailblazer. So, um, yeah, I can, you know, direct you to what part in the um, website where you'll find some, some of those articles about, you know, now that you've identified the lagging skills, you know, which one are you going to be looking at first? So, yeah, that that happens a lot, right? I think that's probably pretty common. Um, so for cognitive flexibility, some examples are... Um, seeing shades of gray rather than the black or white thinking. Now see this, um, oh, difficulty. I was going to say they don't see, see shades of gray. <laughs> they have a hard time seeing that in between. They're kind of a black or white thinker. It's yes or no. Um, it would really be hard for them to do some kind of exercise of, you know, like what if, and for them to, think about something that's like not concrete, not right there. That might be really hard for them. Changes in routines, original plans, overgeneralizing or personalizing information. You always blame me. Um, so these are examples of kids that are lagging in the cognitive flexibility skills. Um, and so, like I said, they also might be having trouble with executive functioning, language processing, emotion regulation. You want to be able to go through each one of these. And there's um, an you know, a assessment that Dr. Ross Green has that you can use. Sometimes you hear, you know, the function is a the student is trying to avoid others, but why? So maybe lagging social skills you know, being able to interpret from verbal and nonverbal social cues can be really challenging for a lot of kiddos, um, you know, especially students on the spectrum. These kind of pragmatic language skills that are also social skills can be hard. Um, starting conversations with peers, um, joining group activities, understanding how his or her behavior affects others, you know, being able to process that when you kick somebody, why do you think they get upset with you? Um, being able to empathize with others can be challenging sometimes. Being able to appreciate others' perspectives. And I mean, this is like for us as adults too, right? Um, understanding how he's coming across to others. So again, we want to look at the types of skills that your child might be lagging in and use that as information that's going to help us write the IEP and if necessary, write um, a good behavior intervention plan. You always want to look and make sure there's you know, look at the other lagging skill areas too. So the whole kind of main moral of the story is <laughs> we need to be explorers and we need to look under that tip of the iceberg and we need to be looking at underlying causes and not just functions. So give me a Amen, if this is making sense. <laughs> um, tuning in at the bus stop. So Anita says, tuning in at the bus stop. So do you mean, <laughs> so do you mean um, like he's not paying attention or she at the bus stop? 
or what? And this must be like a trailblazer group. I love all the trailblazers here today. <laughs> um, and Karen says, we do, um, we do a lot of plan C right now. So she is familiar with Dr. Russ um, to reduce pressure. Yeah. So that's the thing. I mean, it's not like you can easily take some of this new knowledge, like go to Dr. Green's website and necessarily be this expert. I'm not trained um, in the collaborative, it used to be called collaborative problem solving. Now it's collaborative proactive. I can't remember who can tell me. <laughs> um, CPS, what the new acronym for CPS is. Um, so there will have to be things like teacher training, right? I mean, we can't expect all teachers to, um, you know, be able to have the skills to look at kids in a different way instead of a strict behaviorist point of view. Um, a strict behaviorist is going to ask, you know, what happened right before the behavior, the antecedent, what the behavior was, what the consequence was. Um, however, so many times what I see with, um, you know, reports that are written from a behaviorist point of view is that they still don't identify um, the why. And and also, I think, give the child credit for sometimes the behavior is an automatic stress reaction, right? That fight, flight, freeze. Um, and it's not that they're being willfully bad kids at school. And as Dr. Green says, you know, kids will do well. <laughs> it's like, I don't know why I always forget that one. But if kids can, they will. Um, if Shannon, your son has the skills to regulate that energy, he would be doing that. And so by the fact that we're seeing that that's something that's, you know, I don't know, interfering maybe with his learning, then we need to look at how can we channel that energy? How can we allow him more movement in the classroom? Things like that. Um, so yeah, solutions. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Collaborative, proactive solutions. Um, so that's the CPS program. So thanks. Yeah, I just really think it's a very positive place. Um, so Anita says, I better do this. Um, spent greater part of last school year trying to figure out behaviors and now know certain behaviors were unfamiliar symptoms of seizure alerts, have added a diagnosis of epilepsy. So how interesting, right? So, you know, sometimes we poo-poo those health histories or something that we're asked to do. But yeah, looking at some of the medical things that are going on with your child, which obviously they have no control of. And if it was behavior that was bugging the staff, there might be a behavior plan that's like totally inappropriate because they don't realize that the child has no control over these seizures, right? And the behavior that happens right before the seizure. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Anita. Um, Susan, hey Susan, she says, um, so many lagging skills in every area in my third grader, where to begin, compounded by her lack of understanding of why adults have the authority to tell her what to learn and any desire to listen to adults. Um, and so, yeah, look at that little assertive, um, daughter you have and I think part of it is to celebrate you know part of me is like yes um I remember I was visiting my mom in a um I don't know not a nursing home but you know a rehab place after surgery she had to be there and she had to go to my mom had to go to physical therapy and it was 
in this rehab place <laughs> and they had all these patients um, people sitting around in this big circle and it was like group therapy <laughs> and the physical therapist would have people stand up sit down do different things and there was one elderly lady and the physical therapist kept saying okay mrs jones stand up and mrs jones would be no mrs jones come on now stand up no and it was like i was like secretly cheering her on because it's like compliance is a, a bias I have against the word compliance. So I like to substitute the C word for choice. And Susan, um, so I think in ways that is a strength of your child. Um, and, you know, she is showing that she, you know, to me, maybe <laughs> the underlying cause might be for her to feel that control and that power, which is like a normal need for all of us. <coughs> Excuse me. But Susan, have you had um, conversations? I bet you have <laughs> with the teacher. Um, I'm sure it doesn't make the teacher very happy. Um, so yeah, Susan, if you go to Dr. Green's website, and when I email out the resources on Tuesday, if you're on my email list, I'll have like the exact place to go in the website where he talks about, you know, now that you've identified these lagging skills, like what's the next step? Um, and like I said, there's a lot of video trainings and articles to read. So it's a really good site to get some, you know, other information from. All right, so we're going to be explorers. We're going to go under that tip of the iceberg. And we want to do that because we want to help kids be able to solve problems. And when we look at identifying how we're going to solve problems, we want to be really specific with the who, what, when, and where. And this is not a training on Dr. Green's um, framework, but just to give you some kind of background information. There's his website, Lives in the Balance. Really good. Let's switch gears. And I want to talk a couple minutes about what the federal law IDEA says about FBAs and BIPs. And I bet you'll be surprised. So anybody want to make a guess? Let me just make sure I'm sharing my slide here. Um, I don't think I was. Uh, what do you think the federal law says? Does the federal law say, yeah, you gotta do a functional behavior assessment and you gotta write a behavior plan or does the federal law say only in certain circumstances do you have to write it, you know, do an FBA or write a behavior plan? What do you think the federal law says? And while you're typing in your thoughts there, let's see what Anne Marie says. She says, we just got um, a communication device. Look at that. Behavior is communication. Yes, we need to spell that out on every billboard. Um, hopefully the device will prevent negative behavior from the lack of verbal communication. Um, let's say hi to Betty. Hey, Betty. Um, yes, you're right on track, Anne-Marie. Um, and I didn't make a slide, but it's like, yeah, that's the mantra, right? Behavior is communication and what is a child communicating to us now when I ask somebody that comes from a real strict behaviorist background and you and you know you say what's what's the behavior communicating they pretty much come from that function level that tip of the iceberg level and they're saying oh his behavior is communicating that um, he's trying to avoid his work well, then we go, but why is he trying to avoid the work? Um, 
so yes, behavior is certainly communication. It makes me so sad when I have families call me that have um, middle schoolers. And even I've had this happen for a couple of high schoolers where they don't have any way of communicating with others. They might have some real nuanced kind of signs that they use at home. Um, but they don't have a communication device. They don't have any practical way that they can communicate. Well, I cannot imagine living years of your life, living a month without being able to communicate. So yeah, I'm so glad, Emory, that your son got a communication device. Um, or I don't know, I can't remember if it's your son or daughter. Um, yeah, I mean, that's going to be huge. The other thing that you have to really look at with communication devices for school time is to make sure it's always right there. I mean, I've had schools say, oh, the communication device is accessible to him anytime he wants it. Well, it's down the hall in a special ed room in a closet. It's like, uh, I don't think that means the communication device is accessible. Um, so you want that device right there. That's his voice. He always needs to have a, a voice wherever he is, wherever he goes. Um, and that's a huge thing that you want to make sure that the staff understands. Um, and Karen says, having a device has reduced my son's frustration significantly. I hope um, you see good results. So yeah, I... I bet you'll see a big difference, Emory. Um, yeah, it's so nice that like they're smaller now. When my son was in kindergarten, he got a Dynavox, which was like big and clunky and heavy. <laughs> and now it's like so great to see like just an iPad or a tablet, you know, the programs that you can have in there. Um, you know, you still might think about recess time, you know, do you have a good case for the device or PE? Sometimes students will also still have like some visual cards in their pocket or whatever. So if the whole device isn't with them during PE or something, although it should be there, um, they have another kind of backup way to communicate. But yeah, that makes a huge difference. So Anybody guess yet what the federal law says about FBAs and BIPs? Let's go back to our slide. Come here. Okay. Look at here. IDEA does not define functional behavior assessments or behavior intervention plans. It's like, what? So where did all these FBAs and behavior plans come from? <laughs> there is some mention of this in IDEA. So let's look here. IDEA only requires an FBA and a BIP for a manifestation determination upon a disciplinary change in placement. So the only time that um, a functional behavior assessment or a behavior plan is mentioned is when certain things happen, like the child's been suspended for more than 10 days in one school year, if there's a pattern of behaviors that are a concern, and then there's a meeting called a manifestation determination meeting, and you look at is the behavior that you're seeing caused by the student's disability. Um, so in those circumstances, when a child has been suspended for more than 10 days or a pattern, um, quite often, if the school hasn't done one previously, they'll do a functional behavior assessment, they'll write a behavior plan. Part of the other reason of having that manifestation determination meeting is to see if the IEP and if there's a behavior plan has really been implemented with fidelity, or is that what the cause of all of this kind of behavior challenges coming up is about? Because maybe they're not following the IEP and the accommodations in there. 
Hey, Heather, look at you guys. Another trailblazer. <laughs> Heather is from Florida and she is like a research ninja. So if you need something looked up, you ask Heather, where can I find this? <laughs> um, so let's look a little bit more here. The other place where um, there's mention of some of the ideas behind the behavior intervention plans, if a behavior it impedes your child's learning or the learning of others, then the IEP team is required to consider the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports. Um, now the trick is, I mean, this can be a whole nother show and I'm actually going to try and get a guest speaker to talk about this. Um, it sounds so good, positive behavioral interventions and supports. Um, however, when you take a deeper dive, <laughs> um, you also see that those are usually really behaviorist based instead of, um, to me, human based or um, trauma informed base that so many of our kids need. Um, so the point here is there are, you know, only a couple circumstances when IDEA talks about doing a behavior plan or, you know, conducting the FBA. So the big point, as always, is to check your state laws. Check your state laws, your district policy about writing behavior plans, doing the functional behavior assessment. Um, because with IDEA, only kind of touching on that lately <laughs> in the federal statute and rights, um, they left states a lot of leeway into what the state law, the state regs can be around FBAs and behavior plans. So you always want to check what your state laws say. So I, you know, it's like this is all well and good, but how are we going to change things? If the traditional FBA is behavior based, and if we see that as not being a good fit for um, how we view children, um, then we want to change, right? We want to create some change. So what can we do? One, you can look at your state laws and if they need to be changed, you can work on that. Two, we need to train teachers to change their lens that they view children with. Three, we could add other assessments like Ross Green's assessment of lagging skills and unsolved problems in combination with the traditional um, FBA. So changing state laws is a big lofty goal and it can happen and parents have been the center of many changes with laws, right? From parent groups. However, if you're going to your child's IEP meeting next week and they're gonna be talking about the functional behavior assessment they just did or whatever, I mean, you need to have something that's gonna happen faster. So changing laws, training teachers need to happen but it's not going to be something that's going to help you next week with your child. So kind of the band-aid approach, which isn't, you know, always a good idea, but to me, there's got to be some way we kind of get our foot in the door to help people look at our kids' behavior um, in a more um, helpful way. So one of the things that I think we could do today is when you sign consent for a functional behavior assessment, you also say <laughs> and request that you supplement that with some other tools. Excuse me. And you might be thinking, well, that's great, Charmaine, but what are these other tools? So we talked about, um, Ross Green a lot today, um, but there are other people out there too. And so just to remind you, 
of this book um, by Heather Forbes. And my light kind of shroop. But it's the Trauma-Informed School. And this is mainly written for administrators. But I always um, suggest that parents also check out books like this. You can go to your library. If the library doesn't have it, you can request it. Um, you can, of course, buy your own copy, but it gets expensive to keep buying books, right? Um, but there are alternatives out there. And if you're on my email list, you'll get some additional alternative tools that teachers can use that you can use at home. Um, when I email my weekly newsletter out Tuesday morning. So if you're not on my email list, let me know and we can make sure that happens for you. Um, the bottom line is we always want to remember that kids do well if they can. It's not kids do well if they wanna, it's kids do well if they can. And so that's the lens, that's the philosophy that I hope your school team is taking. And if you feel like you want more information about changing how your school looks at your child's behavior, you know, type in your comments, your questions here. I'll be back, um, you know, off and on throughout the next few days. And I always respond to your questions and comments. So that's a way we can keep the conversation going. Um, I appreciate you being here because it is a learning time for us together, right? Mindy, it's like a reunion of trailblazers. <laughs> Hello, on my way. Uh, on my drive home from work. Hey, and I, you know, this is a good um, time for me to remind people that I turned this live audio, um, video into an audio file and I always post them on sound, SoundCloud. And when I send out my weekly newsletter, I'll put the link to watch the replay of this, but I'll also put the link for the podcast of this. So when you are out and about driving, um, you can just listen to the podcast. So I know. <laughs> um, so thanks for being here. Thanks for being parents that are being persistent, um, that are being curious about other ways of doing things. Thank you for being the parent that wants to create that positive change that we need to see. So next week is going to be our 150th Facebook Live show. So I don't know. Plus, it's the day before Valentine's Day. So I've got some secrets up my sleeve for next week's show. I am Charmaine Tanner. I hope to see you again here next Thursday at noon Mountain Time. Until then, have a glorious day.